And uh, why don't you go ahead and turn your Bibles to Romans chapter 10. But we're going to go to Matthew chapter 9 before we go to Romans chapter 10. At least I'm going to quote a little bit of that. You're familiar with it by now. Let me take just a moment while you're turning and uh, we get ready for the message. Uh, you know, when you're a church like you folks have here and you put the emphasis that you put on missions, um, let me tell you a blessing you may not know about right quickly. I saw Richie on the video. Shane, uh, I'm going to leave somebody out from this church, and I don't want to do that. But all of those folk have been in our church and our missions conference. And can I tell you this? They are a reflection of who you are. And it's not just how good of a job we do at Capital City when we have a missions conference. It's the missionaries that come, and you can always tell what kind of church they come from. If you listen to them and hear their testimonies and talk around all the times you eat, which is quite a few more times than you go to church and fellowship together, uh, you learn something. So be thankful. Be proud in the right way that your church is sending out labors that are not only going to impact the, world, the part of the world that they're going to, but they're Im impacting churches like our church. And uh, we're not a large church. When I tell you that, we're not. When I went to Columbia, I decided to do something different. The first church I started, uh, we grew a lot numerically, and it was a great church, and we did a lot for missions. But when I went to Columbia, and I told you a little bit about that last night, I made some life-changing decisions that pretty well went, some of them went against the grain of our fundamentalist brethren. But when we planted a church in Columbia, I believe, and I know your pastor does too, in our situation, we knew that we needed to target the area our church is in, and then we needed to target other areas and plant churches there by men that got saved in our church, got their training, discipled, and when they were ready and worked on staff for a while, we sent them to an area. Every, of the five churches that we've started, every one of them run more than our church does. We have grandchildren now because they have started churches. And that's what we ask our missionaries to do. So, uh, boy, I can't tell you the impact that you've had in my life, Cherry Street, and your pastor, and I thank you for that. I really do. Tonight I'm going to talk about another aspect of what we've been thinking of in our theme. The harvest is plenteous, but the labors are few. I've talked a lot Sunday and last night about the harvest. Tonight I want to talk to you about the labors. They are few. They are few. Romans chapter 10 is another one of those great missionary chapters, especially when you study the middle part of the chapter, which we're going to look at. I'm not going to read it right now. But let me tell you the premise for, in which I'm thinking tonight as I talk to you about missions again. In the halls of churches, in the rooms of Bible colleges and seminaries, there's been an age-old question that's been asked and debated, and the question is this. What happens to those who have never heard the gospel? What happens to them? And the question stirs up a lot of debate, a lot of theological opinions about this, that, or the other. That question has become sharply focused in the 21st century due to the clash of civilizations, especially the confrontation between Christianity and Islam. It is now, in most places, considered rude if you say... I believe that Jesus Christ is the only way a person can go to heaven. That creates a lot of controversy. Religions don't like that. But a relationship with Christ, you know that is the only way you're going to go to heaven. 
but it's created a lot of controversy and a lot of questions. And when I think about the world, and you think about the world, and we think about the harvest and how large and big it really is, and then we think about the workforce, we have to ask ourselves a question. Have we really thought a lot in our hearts and in our minds about really what does happen to people who do not know the Lord? Now, I know you know theologically and biblically that a person that dies without Christ goes to eternal separation from God in a place called hell and ultimately will be cast into the lake of fire for all eternity. That, that bothers me. Does it bother you? If it doesn't, it sure should. There's a guy named Stuart Briscoe, and he offers this answer. He is a Bible teacher and a missionary, and he was talking about the lost of the world. And listen to what he said. He said, the unreached populations of the world are a scandal to the name of Christ and his church. Listen, the problem is not that we are here and they are there. The problem is that after 2,000 years, so many people still have never heard the gospel message. My, what a powerful but truthful statement. The scandal is the 2,000 years after the Lord left, people around the world still are dying in large numbers every day, many never hearing once what we hear every Sunday, every Wednesday night, every revival service, television, radio, media, and in so many different ways. So Paul explains in this chapter the universal offer of the gospel, and in the context, he's talking about Israel's unbelief. But there's certainly application here to us. When we see God's concern for the nations, his willingness to save all who believe, his desire to see the good news go to every nation and his patient grief and persistence and his love for those who reject him is unquestionable when you read the scripture. With that in mind, I want to give you just six little principles, maybe we could call them that, that I see in this passage of scripture. And we're just going to go right down the verses and look at them together. And here, first of all, I want you to see this. Why are we to care about those who have never heard about Jesus? Why is the clarion call still to those that we have in our churches, wherever we are? Would you consider being part of the labor force? Would you consider you going to China? Would you consider going to Sierra Leone? I think pastor said this, and I want to insert it here right quickly. If you won't walk across the street and tell your neighbor how to go to heaven, you probably don't care as much as you should about a Chinese man going to heaven. It starts at home. It starts in our hearts. It starts in our Jerusalem. So why we care about those who have never heard about Jesus? Number one, and this, there's nothing profound about what I'm going to say, but I hope God drives it home in your heart like he has mine. Because God made salvation universally available. Look, if you will, at verse 12. For there is no difference between the Jew and the Greek. For the same Lord over all is rich unto all that call upon him. And here's a verse we've all used if we witness. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Have you thought about this? It wouldn't make sense to spend money on Africans if Africans couldn't be saved. It wouldn't make sense for us to send this young lady to China if Chinese didn't need to be saved. It wouldn't make sense if we send missionaries to Sierra Leone or to Japan or to Canada and the missionaries represented in this conference. It wouldn't make sense to send any of them to any of those places if everybody in that country that hasn't heard about Jesus wasn't going to get saved. So I want, you to, I want this to burn in your heart like it does mine, that God has made salvation universally available to everybody. 
The text contains no limitations. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Not white middle-class Americans. No, no, no. They need to get saved. And if they'll call on the Lord, they can. Not the suburbanites. Yet they can be saved if they call upon the Lord. People raised in evangelistic homes and churches, if they haven't trusted Christ, they need to be saved. But every little boy roaming the streets of Sierra Leone that has never heard the gospel, he needs to be saved. And if somebody doesn't go, he may never hear. And if he doesn't hear, hell will be his for eternity. That bothers me. I hope it bothers all of us. Cameron Townsend was a missionary to Guatemala. And he was trying to share the gospel with a tribe that had never heard the gospel. They spoke a little Spanish, but they had their own language, their own dialect, and no one had ever translated the Bible into their language. And one day Cameron Townsend was trying to witness to one of the Indians And he had a copy, somehow had gotten his hands on the Spanish Bible. And Cameron Townsend asked that Indian a question that changed his life forever. And the Indian said this. He said, if your God is so great, why can't he speak my language? Cameron Townsend said, that question turned into a dream, a nightmare that affected my vision. And I went back home and I met with some businessmen and some Christians and some churches. And I said, we have got to do something. And because of that one question, that man asked, if your God is so great, why can't he speak my language? The Wycliffe Bible translators was founded. I'm telling you, We need the Word of God translated into languages. Who's going to do that? Laborers. Yes, church planters. Yes, starting Christian schools and Bible institutes and Bible colleges to train the people that we lead to the Lord. Yes, yes, a million times yes. Why? Because the gospel is universal to anybody and everybody that will believe it. Number two. Secondly, because no one can be saved without the preaching of the gospel. Look at verse 14. How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him in whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? Boy, those are strong howls, aren't they? Paul lays out the progression very clearly in that verse. First comes the preaching, then comes the hearing, then comes the believing, and then comes the calling. In order for people in the world to call upon the name of the Lord, somebody's got to preach the gospel to them. Nothing's going to fall out of the sky. Somebody has got to go to that person and go to that people group and go there and preach the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Can I do a little side note here, Brother Dennis? I'm sick and tired in America of us preaching from our pulpits all the time 10 ways to love yourself. I wish we could get back to just preaching the gospel and preaching God's word verse by verse. Hey, you don't need to teach anybody how to love themselves better. I love myself so much I could talk to you a long time about it. And so does everybody else. I need to know how to love God better so I can tell people the glorious truth that Christ died, was buried, and rose again. And because of that, I can have eternal life in Christ. I can have eternal life in Christ. God has ordained that nobody can be saved without the preaching of the gospel. Think about that. You think about these missionaries that are going to these different places. The reason they're going primarily is to preach the gospel. I was asked to teach a class in a Bible college that you probably don't know anything about, and I'm not going to mention the name of it, to 80 students who were missionaries, students, 
that said that they were going to go to somewhere in the world and they were going to be missionaries. A staff member in our church taught in that college, and the college president asked if he or he could get somebody to come and teach a week on personal soul winning. So the college professor in our church asked me if I would do that. So I volunteered, went over to the school, beautiful kind of theater setting with all the 80 students sitting there. And I talk about something that you hear all the time here about soul winning and personal evangelism. And I got down to, to, to where I was talking about the fact, you know, my goal when I go out on visitation is to, is, is to be able to tell somebody, get to the point in my conversation with them where I can take God's Word and I can show them the gospel because the gospel is the power of God unto salvation, not my personality, not my persuasiveness. The gospel is the power of God unto salvation and to share that with them. And I said, now all of y'all are going to the mission field somewhere. And I said, the number one goal you have when you go to the mission field is to preach the gospel, whether it's in a coffee shop, whether it is in a church service, wherever it is, when God gives you opportunity, preach the gospel. It still works, folks. It really does. And I can't tell you how important that is. Number three, because no one can preach until somebody's sent. I told you this wasn't going to be profound. But look at verse 15. And how shall they preach? Except they be sent. As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. Paul here is quoting Isaiah chapter 52 and verse 7, where the context of that passage is the coming day of peace, of peace for Jerusalem and ultimately for the world. And the prophet speaks to a generation weary of war, frightened by the storm clouds gathering on the horizon. And the people of Isaiah's day heard of wars and rumors of wars, just like we're hearing today. And, but the dream of the world peace seemed to be elusive. And I'm just giving you a quick overview of the context because I want you to get that in your mind for a moment because Spurgeon describes what the prophet Isaiah said here. He said, the prophet sees people coming down the mountainside. He looks at them and perceives that they're not men of war. Yet here they come, a great company from the mountaintops descending into the valley. Who are they? And he looks at them, and you know what he says? How beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of them that do what? Preach the gospel. Preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. They're coming bearing the white flag. Servants of the king with whom you've been at war. They hold the banner and, and sound forth the greatest message that's ever been given. Think about this. In Paul's day, nobody had a cell phone in the book of Acts. Nobody had live stream. Nobody had TV. I'm glad for all those things today if they enable us to preach the gospel. And thank God you're a church that does that. Because everything depended on the message and depends upon the message that we preach. And that is the gospel. How though will they hear that gospel and how will they hear the preacher preach it if we don't send them? If we don't do it ourselves? Number four, because faith only comes by hearing the word of God. That's the only way. Look, look, at, look at the text, verse 16. But they had not obeyed all obeyed the gospel. For Isaiah saith, Lord, who had believed our report? 
So then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. Not all the Israelites accepted the good news. But that didn't stop the prophet from still preaching what? The word of God. The word of God. Our job today is to preach the good news of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. And that faith that needs to come comes when we believe what God has said. And when we preach the gospel, people will get saved. Maybe not in the numbers we want to see them get saved. I think different fields are more difficult than other fields. Brother Dennis and I, a couple of years ago, were in the Philippines. It just blew, I mean, it blows my mind to see how many people are getting saved. How many... We were in two churches, Bethany Baptist in Manila and uh, Bible Baptist in Cebu City. And I'm, I'm talking about people getting saved left and right. I still watch Bible Baptist in Cebu's Sunday services and listen to Kent preach. And he'll give those reports. Well, this group went over here to this place. They had 64 people trust Christ as their Savior. And he reads a list a mile long about how many people are coming to Christ. Then we got on the plane. We went to Thailand. I want you to know that the people in Thailand, the missionaries there, are just as fervent and love the God of the Philippines as much as anybody else in the world. But, oh, I tell you, I can tell you, when I walked down that airport trying to keep up with him, And we finally got to our room, and then we went to church on Sunday morning. And I watched that. I watched Shane and and his family and others there that are there there to help. You talk about difficult. You, brother Dennis, if I'm wrong, you you correct me. There was a spirit there against the gospel that you could not even feel in the Philippines. And yet, is it important that Shane be in Thailand? Is it important that he's getting ready to start another church? Absolutely. He may not have 5,000 in his auditorium. There may be but 50, but I want to tell you there's more rejoicing in heaven over one person who truly repents than 99 just persons who need no repentance. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the Word of God. Number five, because God always intended the gospel to go to the ends of the earth. You've heard the illustration about the meeting in hell. It's a, it's a fantasy illustration, but it illustrates a point where the imps got together and the devil's upset because too many people were getting saved and he said, we got to come up with some kind of plan. And so they began, the demons began to exp- give different things that they needed to do. And all the things they suggested, the devil said, no, that won't work. And finally one said, I know where to work. Just get people to do nothing with the gospel. And hell will enlarge itself over and over again. I tell you that because God doesn't have any plan B. He's only got one plan. Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Look at verse 18. But I say, have they not heard? Yea, verily, their sound went out into all the earth and their words unto the ends of the world. But I say, did not Israel know? For Moses saith, I will provoke you to jealousy by them that are no people. And by a foolish nation, I will anger you. But Isaiah is very bold and saith, I have found of them that sought me not. I have made manifest unto them that ask not after me. I don't have time to give you all that I like to give you right there, but I'm going to give you a little bit. And basically, you know what is being said there in the context. Remember the context is to Israel. But the application is certainly to us. You know what's being said there? Israel had heard the message over and over and over again. The Gentiles had never heard the message. So you know what what Paul said? I'm going to take the message 
to the Gentiles because they'll listen. Do you know what? There's a whole big wide world out there. And sometimes we get stuck in a rut with people who don't want to hear. And what we need to get up, we need to get out of the rut and go over here to where they want to hear. You say, do you not care about those? No one, they've heard it over and over and over again. We need to go to somewhere where they'll listen, where they'll care. That's what he's talking about. You can, it's undeniable. That's what he's talking about. And it brings me back to the point. God has intended for the gospel to go to every nation, every tribe, every people. But not every nation, not every tribe, and not every people want to hear. Now, let me help you out a little bit. I don't know who they are, and neither do you. So my job is to carry the mail, and God will do his part. He always has, and he always will. Finally, because God still loves the world in spite of its sin. Look at verse 21. But to Israel, he saith, all day long I have stretched forth my hands into a disobedient and gainsaying people. You can pick up the newspaper or turn on the TV, and every day you read about murder and all kind of illicit things taking place, drugs and abandoned children, battered wives, this young girl, I think they have found her body now that they've been looking for for 20 days. Sin, suffering everywhere. And in verse 21, you know what God says? God essentially says this. You love the world anyway. That's your job. I love the world you love the world anyway, in spite of what's going on. I, I think I remember correctly the first time the Evans were at our church and they showed some of the things that you're seeing this week. Is when you see that little child bride there that's been sold to some man. You saw that this morning in the in our meeting with the senior science. It's hard to imagine anybody could even think or do something like that. But it really isn't if you understand the power sin has in the lives of people and the darkness they find themselves in. So the only hope for the darkness of sin is the light of the gospel. But how will they hear if the labors are so few? We've already established it over and over again. Even long before I got here, the harvest is plentiful. It's plenteous. But the labors are few. Now, I'm going to say this because, and I'm speaking for me, okay? I'm not trying to, I, I don't want to hurt anybody's feelings, nor do I want to start anything. But here's what I, here, here's what I want to tell you. We have got to have a revival of missions. I'm telling you, we do. And here's why we do. I have, and, I, and I'm not talking about the BBFI. I could include the BBFI with missionaries that we support with Baptist mid-missions and other missionary agencies that we support missionaries with that are taking the gospel to the ends of the earth also. I'm talking about overall. Every missions sending agency in this country the sending force of that agency is continuously declining. It's true in all of them. The average, independent, fundamental, Bible-believing Baptist church in America, it has been years, if at all, that anybody's ever gone out from their church to preach the gospel. Now, I don't preach out as much as I used to but I preach out enough to know that that's true. I, again, I'm just talking to you just for a minute from my heart because I got gray hair up here too, so I can call, talk us gray heads. I, we, we, we've given, we've prayed, and we got to keep giving, and we got to keep praying, but we got to get some folks that don't have gray hair to help us. We got to have some folks when 
the gray hair has to come home because they're sick and have to retire, or the Lord chooses to call them home, we got to have some folks that are ready to stand up and, and say, I'll go. You know why? Not because we're trying to set a record on how many we can send. We're doing it because the harvest is plenteous and the laborers are few. I'm going to tell you a quick story and I'll quit. I'm not through, but I'll quit. Because I want you to come by tomorrow night. We support a missionary. We started supporting him about 30 years ago. His name is Carl Godfrey. Now, you're going to think, he was a missionary in Nassau, Bahama. You say, boy, what a life to be a missionary in Nassau. Well, if you've ever been to Nassau, he was on the wrong side of the bridge. Paradise Island was over here. Brother Godfrey was over here. In Nassau, there are about 35,000 Haitians. We don't know how many from Haiti to Nassau drown on those dinkies they travel on to try to get there to get work so they can send money back home. So Brother, Gar uh, Brother Godfrey was a mechanic in Charlotte, North Carolina. He went to Northside Baptist Church and heard an old race car driver that got saved by the grace of God, Jack Hudson, stand up and start preaching the gospel. And Carl Godfrey got saved. He went to Tennessee Temple, and he said, I know where I'm going. I'm going to Nassau. And I'm going to build a church for the Haitians because they hate their, the, the, the Bahamians don't like the Haitians. And so they did. Him and Miss Godfrey went and they started the Calvary Baptist Church. I went down and preached. Oh, how my soul was started, uh, uh, stirred. Those Haitians had come in there and they'd sit sideways so they'd have, I mean, and they'd have the windows down. Brother Dennis, I could wring water out of my suit every time I preached. And I'd say, and now I'm close. No, don't close. Don't close. I've never seen that happen in America in a Baptist church. I mean, they, they come. They wanted to hear all I could give them. It wore me out. But what a week it was. Long story short, 300 members every Sunday. Haitians go to that church. Brother Godfrey went to be with the Lord 20 years ago. His wife just come home. She's 80-some years old. She can't go back. And she stayed, and she worked with the ladies and the children. And he had, he had discipled a young man in the church who's now the pastor of that church. And they have started four other churches in Nassau for Haitians. And they've even started churches back in Haiti with national pastors there where they can preach the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. When Brother Godfrey died, I asked Mrs. Godfrey to come to our missions conference. And like we do on Sunday morning, we had the missionaries just give a quick thank you and testimony and that kind of thing before we uh, preach and, and get to faith promise. And here comes Miss Godfrey. Now, you got to know Miss Godfrey like I know her to appreciate it. But here she come, and she had a Walmart plastic bag in her hand. And I thought, boy, this ought to be interesting. And she is just as country as the day is long. And Ms. Godfrey stood up and she said, she called her husband Junior, Carl, she called him Junior Baby. And she said, Junior Baby's in heaven. We started this church down there. I mean, just as murders of King's English. You, I mean, she just, she, she is unique. And she said, you know what? She said, I wanted to bring something this morning. And she reached in that plastic bag, and she pulled out his shoes. She carries them with her, with her everywhere she went. It's okay if I took my shoes off. Isn't it? <laughs> everywhere she'd take those shoes. And, boy, she looked out at our church, and tears running down her cheeks. And she says, who's man enough to come up here and fill them? There's people. The harvest is plenteous. The labors are few. The shoes are there. Who'll put them on and say, I'll go. 
oh, we can't uproot and, and all that kind of stuff and go somewhere like that. Oh, you can if God gets a hold of your heart. Yes, you can. And can I tell you, some of you must if you'll just listen to God. The harvest is plenteous, but the labors are few. Bow your heads. Thank you for listening.